It's been about almost 20 years since my colleagues and I did the first study of feedback in the field of psychotherapy. What we were looking at was whether it made a difference to have therapists simply ask for feedback when they felt like it, or use some standardized measures and do it every single time they met. We were going to compare whether or not one way worked better than another. Why introduce paper forms at that particular time or electronic measures? What we found was, I think, rather intriguing. Everyone says they ask for feedback, but unless it was routine and unless it was standardized, many times therapists forgot to ask for feedback in that particular condition where they were free to do so in a kind of free form fashion. So in this particular case, what we mean by feedback is asking every visit and using a standardized scale, a scale by which we can determine whether a client is satisfied with the particular visit or there are problems in the relationship and whether they're making progress like most clients in similar situations and circumstances would be making if the treatment were successful. That feedback gives me as the clinician a crucial opportunity to adjust services to establish a better fit with my client and to change things so that progress is more likely to occur. What do the data say? 25% improvement in outcomes when we do that. When we measure, we have to be very careful about what it is we want to know. And in terms of feedback informed care, we want to know two things. And the reason we want to know them is because these things are predictive of effective care. The first one is about the quality of the relationship that I have. It's one of the most robust findings in the treatment literature. If the client and I have a good working relationship, the outcomes tend to be better. Engagement surely is higher. If clients begin to make progress in care early on in the treatment, that allows me to continue what I'm doing. If they're not, of course, I can make adjustments to keep them engaged and to also improve the chances of a successful outcome. Is that the same as customer satisfaction? Two very separate constructs, customer satisfaction, that is, and relationship, customer satisfaction and progress in care. What I'm sure will be the case is that when we end successfully as a result of using feedback, we'll have more satisfied customers. The question about outcome of psychotherapy is a really important one. And throughout the history of the field, it's been measured in many ways. The standard way it's measured is by some client completed standardized measurement tool. We could either measure a reduction in symptoms. We could look at the DSM and see whether or not the client no longer meets criteria or we could measure well-being. But most measures that are officially identified, including the ORS as an outcome tool, are really an assessment of the client's level of distress at the, at the time of their particular appointment. The cool thing about measuring that particular construct is that it predicts when clients enter therapy, roughly how long they stay, and when they say, you know, I think I'm good for now. So we're measuring mostly the client's experience of distress in their life. Another way of saying that is their functioning or their well-being. I think most practicing clinicians know that what happens on a session by session basis is critical for success. So when I use the terms regular or routine and suggest that you ask for feedback at every single visit, it's because of that, because so much can change in a single visit. Why not just do a pre and post? 
because as many as 25% of the people we start with drop out early in treatment. The modal number of sessions is one. If I don't assess it every single visit, then I might miss a crucial opportunity to address problems that arise in the relationship early on. If I'm not assessing progress along the way and the client feels like the work is subpar in terms of their progress, that client may decide it's not worth continuing. Or get this, it may be that the client decides that just having a good relationship is perhaps what they can accept as opposed to expecting that their progress be made because as many as 25% of clients will remain in treatment despite the fact that they're not experiencing measurable benefits. So I'm not honestly interested in pre and post. I'm interested along the way assessing because that's where the real work takes place. That's where the opportunity exists for me to adjust the work when I'm not having an optimal relationship or impact on the client's life or well being. There is an investment of time in assessing. But if you actually think about it and look in practice what it takes to administer the two tools, we're, we're talking about 30 seconds. So I prefer not to separate assessment and care. The two of them exist in a gestalt, a kind of yin and yang that help me figure out, are we on track? What do I need to do to adjust services at this particular point and assess along the way in case I need to change something about the work. So I don't think to begin with that these measures take a lot of time. And I also think that particular thought is perhaps problematic. It separates assessment from treatment when the two are an integral part of the entire process we call therapy. We use the ORS to really assess whether or not there's been progress from visit to visit and also to establish a baseline against which we can assess whether any progress or results happen as a result of our work. Why the SRS? Because that is one of the most potent contributors to outcome and from session to session it can vary. Also, we know the addition of that particular tool enhances the effect of feedback informed treatment. I will say that generally speaking, the SRS is the more challenging measure for therapists to get done and to interpret. It's often at the end of the visit. And so if you don't plan accordingly, set out an appropriate amount of time, you might decide to skip it. And the result of that, if there's been a problem in the relationship is the client may decide to skip their next visit. So here's an interesting finding from the treatment literature. When we're struggling with questions about, do I need to ask every time about the quality of the relationship? And it was a finding that was quite accidental. We discovered by administering these tools to large numbers of clients that certain therapists were more effective than others, which led us to wonder, well, what is it that they were doing? And in talking with some of what we call super shrinks or highly effective therapists, we found something quite curious in their reports. They would often evince a kind of humility that was absent in therapists to, that were more average or, or poor in their outcomes. And the question is, how did that show up in their scores? Not their outcomes, because they were highly effective, 
but in their SRS scores, in their Alliance scores. And here's the curious pattern. Those therapists tended to have lower SRS scores in the beginning that improved over time. And that was associated with nearly 50% larger effects. We did not see the same thing in more average therapists. In fact, amongst the poorest therapists, we saw the reverse pattern. They would start with high SRS scores, and then generally those scores would decline somewhat over time. When we asked those poor performing therapists what was going on, they would say things like, it takes time to develop a relationship. With top performers, they have the relationship in constant focus. They're looking for small variations. They're creating an atmosphere where the clients can speak up and speak out, even if it's about small things that might make them participate slightly less or send them slightly off course. The reason to ask routinely for feedback about the quality of the relationship is to capture those small differences in order to maintain optimal engagement and care. We talk about two types of errors that therapists can make in treatment. The first type of error is we call random. We deal as a field with a huge amount of diversity when it comes to our clients. You have to work with whoever walks in the door with you. The fact that our outcomes are so good as practitioners is nothing short of amazing when you think of that fact. So at times, however, we don't optimally respond to the individual. So the first use of the SRS is to help us make minor adjustments that we might otherwise miss just given the sheer diversity and the challenge of diversity that walks into our office every time we meet a new client. The second use for the SRS is what we call addressing non-random errors. These are things that we do that get in the way of our work across clients. By administering the scores on an, by administering the measures on an ongoing basis, we can start to get a picture of where we interrupt client engagement consistently, and then use that as a learning tool to help us augment or change our way of interacting. In other words, learning. <laughs> 